Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 157 interdisciplinarity. Yes, this is a continuation of our single word vlog series, but wow, we are in the groove thing now. The next four are interdisciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity, multi-disciplinarity, and yes, the zombie apocalypse finish post disciplinarity. There are many reasons why we're doing this vlog series. Part of it is about you as a researcher, not only in your PhD program, but beyond it. And also, this comes from multiple requests from S. Hi, S. S would like me to do a lot more theoretical vlogs. And look, S, I would like to live there. I am a woman of theoretical follies. I could just go on and on and on and do vlog after vlog after vlog about theory. But look, we won't do that. The point of these vlogs are is you make a suggestion and I come up with something for you. But this vlog, and in fact the next four, are a bit of a continuation of my stroppy guide series that so many of those vlogs about 50 or so will go down stroppy professors guide to so I am a bit stroppy this week and indeed for the next month so just get get yourself ready for it uh, and I am a bit angry but also a bit disappointed oh and so let's talk about why that is and how we as a family can make a commitment and transform this and the reason I think I'm so worried and concerned and indeed stroppy about the word interdisciplinarity and how it's used right now is so many of my outstanding colleagues, both alive and dead, who committed deeply to interdisciplinarity uh, are being disrespected through people just ticking a box on a ground. Oh, am I interdisciplinary? Yes, I am. And we are forgetting our intellectual heritage. We're forgetting our intellectual history and the people who did the top end, heavy lifting intellectual work, transforming knowledge to claim that word interdisciplinarity. And further, many of their careers suffered because of that commitment to interdisciplinarity. So every time you feel yourself saying, oh, well, I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, you just check yourself and make sure you really are and you're not actually flattering yourself. This is actually a thing, a concept, a trope, and it has a powerful, a passionate, and important intellectual history. So part of what I'm trying to do in the next four vlogs is bring back these histories so when these words are used they're used with clarity and intelligence and meaning but also with a little bit of intellectual generosity understanding the great scholars that preceded us and how their careers may have suffered through their commitments that we take for granted. So I told you I was going to get a bit stroppy, so here we go. So, so many of the fields that we take for granted these days, so whether it be nanoscience or cultural studies or socio-legal studies or tourism studies, sustainable development, leisure studies, sports studies, football studies, I could go on and on and on, involve brilliant and really committed people thinking differently, thinking defiantly, thinking courageously, and thinking passionately. And that's what I want to bring back to us today. The problem is now that interdisciplinarity has become a box that we tick on grants. Are you an interdisciplinary scholar? Oh, yes, I'm so interdisciplinary, right? Okay, or indeed, as I've been reading a lot of book proposals in the last month, you know, they've been describing themselves as an interdisciplinary scholar. And then I go, okay, well, that's cool. And then I look at the project, I look at the person's CV and their publications, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, that's biology. That, that's biology. Or that's literature, dude. That, that's literature. They go, oh, yes, but it's interdisciplinary biology. Or it's interdisciplinary literary studies. Dude, it's not. You're using content analysis like it's 1952, mate. It's not interdisciplinary. You're not doing cultural studies. You're not doing media studies. You're not doing internet studies. You are doing literature, dude, like it's 1952. So what I'd suggest is we need to show a little bit more courage and a little bit more innovation. And if you're going to use the word interdisciplinarity, you have to earn it. So let's do a little bit of that earning 
today. So I'm going to get inside these concepts and I'm going to show the differences between them. I think that's quite important. Interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity and the zombie apocalypse finished post-disciplinarity. And many different disciplines use them in different ways. So some of you will have much more resonance each week. But the reason we're doing this is I want you to have a sense of the etymology of these words when you use them. And I hope these terms are useful to you because this isn't just about your PhD research, which is incredibly important and my life is committed to helping you get through and have a fantastic experience and produce a great PhD. But this is also about your career post the PhD because often PhDs are pretty locked into a discipline. You know, you have to be examined by examiners who are locked in a discipline. Often your supervisors are in a particular discipline. So often PhDs reinforce, although the original contribution to knowledge, they reinforce disciplinary boundaries because you've got to be a bit safe because the thesis has got to be examined. But the question is after the PhD, when you're doing your research, what do you stand for? What's meaningful to you? What is important to you? And that's why this discussion matters a lot, because it's about you thinking about your identity as a researcher, who you are and what matters. So we're trying to ask some provocative questions today about what research is, what it does, and its role in society, its role in working with and engaging with other researchers, and indeed stakeholders, I'll use the word. But we always have to ask, when we're formulating our research questions, what are the research questions that we're not asking? The research questions that are simply too unpopular to ask, that perhaps are not in the narrowly defined national interest. So therefore, today we're thinking about new theories, new ways of reading, writing, thinking, interpreting, and yes, disseminating knowledge. And I'm asking us all to reflect on the methods and the methodologies that many of us accept far too easily. I had a great student in the office sitting there a few days ago, and she was saying to me very much, oh, look, I'm going to do content analysis. I looked at her and I said, why, why are you doing content analysis? Where, where's that come from? Why do you need it? You're doing these interviews. You're doing these survey, surveys. Why do you need content analysis with those? Oh, because it's about representativeness. And I said, why are you using the word representation? post Baudrillard, post 983, uh, why would you be using representation? Why is that a thing for you? So these are the complex questions that we ask when we are interdisciplinary. So you may end up using content analysis, but I want you to work for it a little bit more. And that's what interdisciplinarity can give us, reflection on who we are as a researcher. So interdisciplinarity emerges when different disciplines, two or more, integrate in some form. They combine in some form. So particularly interdisciplinarity emerges when the methodologies or the assumptions in one discipline do not enable the answering of a societal or research question. And we have to move into a different discipline, take some methodologies, some theories, some assumptions and create something new create new tools, new reflexive methods, maybe some new assumptions. So the goal is to mix and modify the tropes and the research strategies in one discipline by deploying the expertise of another. Interdisciplinarity, something changes. And that becomes important in the next month of the vlogs we're doing. So what we're trying to do is create new tools that will enable research in difficult subjects that one discipline cannot service. So, for example, so let's get, I'll give you lots of examples today so you can see how this operates. If you're interested in studying the labour market, so the changes in work in particular, we're going to require economics, mathematics, 
geography. We might also require some sense of medicine and health studies, allied health in particular, but also politics and sociology. And that's just my base list. If you're trying to understand the labour market, you're going to need those. Interdisciplinarity, therefore, creates new working practices, behaviours and protocols and challenges radically, I would argue, the assumptions within one discipline. So sustainability, for example, changed so much of what's happened in intellectual life in the last 40, 30, 20 years and particularly in the last 10. So sustainability, let alone sustainable development, sustainability requires a whole series of disciplines to come together to create customised requirements. So ecology, earth sciences, just to give two examples, then economics, sociology, medicine, chemistry, before we even start to think about sustainability. And of course, the brain exploding, econophysics, is just one of the most remarkable examples of interdisciplinarity we will ever see. Taking methods from physics to address economic problems, like, for example, uncertainty. Uncertainty is a great principle that basically economics has now taken from physics and has added a lot of complexity to how we think about uncertainty, but also the non-linear dynamics in financial markets enabled incredibly through physics. So econophysics was first used by Eugene Stanley in the mid-1990s and there are fantastic journals in this area. There's a conference every couple of years that is an active, really interesting conference. But we could argue really the relationship between economics and physics had its origins probably with John Maynard Keynes in his early theories of elasticity and how that operates in the market. So at its best, Interdisciplinarity involves studying a problem, a challenge, a phenomenon. Starting there actually, what is the problem? And then realising one discipline can't solve that problem and needing to bring together and combine a series of points of view to create new tools for analysis. So why interdisciplinarity matters so much beyond ticking a box on a grant application or putting it into a book proposal is that it overtly challenges, it overtly critiques and reveals the dire consequences of excessive specialisation. The consequences of so many of the international research, research assessment, research evaluation protocols, including the ERA in Australia, is that narrowness is rewarded. And that's why I'm being really honest with you today. If you want an easy, successful life, you just keep working that narrow specialisation, keep working that field of research, you just keep doing that, that's great. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. And you can do that. Because our system at the moment is rewarding selfishness and it's rewarding inward research and intellectual practices. So as a great example, I was in a seminar a couple of weeks ago and the value of self-citation was being talked about and said, all right, well, you need to write, you know, have a lot of collaborators and have a lot of authors on every paper because each author self-cites that paper and it picks up its citation rate because you've got lots of authors who self-cite. How have we ended up here? I'm from the generation where you know, you really wouldn't self-cite because that's just a bit embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, that's just what? So you're going to self-cite and pretend other people have read it or good luck with it? So now that's a thing. It's like, oh, well, we're up with lots of people because everybody's completely self-absorbed and they'll cite their own work and you end up with lots of citations just from the authors. Wow, isn't that amazing? Amazing times. I'm glad I've lived long enough to see it. So interdisciplinarity stands for something different. It stands for cooperation, consultation, intellectual generosity, and intellectual curiosity. I thought most of us got into this business because we were curious. And really what interdisciplinarity stands for, and look, this is not popular and it's probably not rewarded in contemporary intellectual life, so you can ignore me. But what interdisciplinarity is about, I think, is that wild, wandering, intellectual spirit. And maybe our universities can't manage people like that anymore. And isn't that a tragedy? But the people who discover 
question, challenge, poke at knowledge, rather than reinforce those gatekeepers, those established ways of doing knowledge and the established ways of gatekeeping our disciplines. New knowledge is created through interdisciplinarity, new methods are created through interdisciplinarity, and particularly really complex social problems are resolved and addressed through interdisciplinarity. And I particularly at this juncture wanted to acknowledge two fields that I thought were going to die on us about 10 years ago, and that's tourism studies and leisure studies. They were, again, gatekeepers got involved in that interdisciplinary field and rendered it a discipline. So leisure studies, tourism studies, they started to patrol the boundaries. But in the last two, three years in particular, in both tourism studies and leisure studies, and a big hello to Daria, uh, we've seen this incredible infusion once more of new and innovative ideas and, and really willful, interesting explorations beyond those gatekeepers and beyond what was leisure studies or tourism studies. Deviant leisure is a great example of that and the post-disciplinary theory in tourism studies at the moment is really provocative. So no single discipline could ever study tourism or leisure and offer concrete policies and strategies and solutions for economic development. But now, through this reinfusion of interdisciplinarity, those fields are fields to watch. So as you can see, interdisciplinarity is not simply a cliche. It's not a way to show that you're down with the young people. It's not edgy man. It's about movement, dialogue, meaningful changes in methods and methodologies that creates new ways of thinking about information and data, new ways of interpreting that information and data, and new ways of writing research. And also in terms of dissemination, interdisciplinarity renders us honest, I think, in terms of research dissemination, because it demands of us that we are rigorous in our language and that we speak to a diversity of disciplines, a diversity of colleagues, a diversity of audiences. And that of course makes it easier for the next generation of scholars who follow us to continue that radical interdisciplinary work. And for me, you know, that's the work of a true scholar, reflecting on knowledge while creating it. I wish you love, light and peace. See ya.